how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And that's Nehemiah 2 and 17. Like me for today's lesson, people are often contemplative before they make major decisions, meaning they think about it, and they weigh it. How does one or should one react after careful consideration of a major decision? Nehemiah set out to rebuild Jerusalem's wall after praying and surveying its ruins. Bible learning, God's servant, Nehemiah, rebuilds the walls and restores Israel's Sabbath laws. In the Bible application, Christians seek peace when comforted with oppression. In the student's response, <clears throat> believers endure ridicule as they continue wholeheartedly to serve the Lord. Let us read these verses, Nehemiah 2, 11 through 20. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. 17. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Verse 19, But when Shalabah, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn, and despised us, and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will, you, will ye rebel against the king? In verse 20, amen, in the last verse. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. We bless the Lord for the reading of the word. Amen. So let's do some background development as we do in our matter, amen. Uh, the introduction, which is printed in your books, and is under the title, The Cupbearer. Let us read that. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to King Xerxes. Uh, remember, King Xerxes was married to Hadasha, which is Esther, amen. Uh, Xerxes I of Persia. As the one who serves the drinks to the king, he was an honorable and prestigious his was an honorable and prestigious position of great trust. While serving in this position, Nehemiah receives visitors from Jerusalem and asks them about events back home. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 2. They give him a very discouraging report about the disgraceful condition of the people and the deplorable state of the city. The crumbling walls had left the city, the temple, and the people vulnerable to attack and gave their enemies cause to ridicule. Although Ezra was an excellent spiritual leader, remember him from last week's lesson, the people lacked political leadership. They needed someone to motivate them, show them where to begin, and to direct their activities. Once receiving the news, Nehemiah weeps and grieves for some days. Think about this, Ezra did the same thing, did he not? He laminated, he, he tore, uh, his clothes, he plucked out his hair, amen. This was Ezra because he was sorrowful for the people's what? Sin. Nehemiah was sorrowful for the people's what? Lack of discipline, amen, to rebuild the walls. All right. All right, so he grieved for some days, fasting and praying. 
about the city's crumbling infrastructure. But what and how? After prayer, Nehemiah is still very distressed, and the king inquires about what's troubling him. And that's in chapter 2, 1 through 2. Nehemiah explains, and the king gives him permission to go to his native country and rebuild its walls and gates. Nehemiah left the comfort of a king's palace to return to his ancient homeland to challenge his countrymen to reconstruct the walls. He was armed with letters of safe passage and full military escort provided by the king. Nehemiah began the almost 1,000 mile trip to Jerusalem. My God. And a little bit more about Nehemiah. He was a man of character, persistence, and prayer. And he was a brilliant planner, an organizer, and motivator. Amen. And he worked alongside Ezra during the last spiritual awakening recorded in the Old Testament. Under verses 11 and 12, we see that he came to Jerusalem. This is picking up in verse 11. And was there three days. And he said he arose in the night and some few men with me. So he went out in the night. Amen. Uh, neither did he tell any man what God had put in his heart to do at Jerusalem. And neither was there beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So let's read underneath that verse. It says the statement, neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon, indicates that he went around the city without an entourage. Amen. He went by himself. He didn't want people to know what he was doing. So he didn't have an entourage, which accompanied him from Persia. And that's Nehemiah 2, 9 through 12. The office of a cupbearer in ancient times was a high and respectable position. At a tour with a person of such prominence, the king's cupbearer would require a huge entourage and perhaps some fanfare. However, Nehemiah chose to tour the ruined city walls privately to avoid public exposure or attracting attention. We can glean right there from that. Amen. Sometimes we need to do what the Lord has told us to do. Amen. And mm. not go get a whole entourage. He's told some of us specific things that we need to do. And it is for us to do. Amen. And it is for us to seek him individually on how he wants us to do it. Amen. Verses 13 through 15. He's surveying the land. And it says, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem. These are different gates within the wall. These are those names, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. They have been destroyed. Let us read under that verse. It says the reoccurring phrase, I went out by night or in the night, you'll find that in verses 12 through 13 and 15, could show that it takes him more than one night, perhaps several nights to complete the survey section by section. He is deliberately surveying the uh, walls. He wants to know what is exactly needed to do what the Lord has told him to do. Another point to glean, honey, we need to prepare in doing God's work. Yeah, yeah I, I don't understand folks who don't strive for excellence in the, in the ministry of God. Mm. Yeah, he is an intelligent God, an intelligent God. He created man and woman. He took time with those creations. He slung the stars in the sky. Yeah, divided the firmament from the earth, meaning he took the water and put it in its place. And we won't prepare Come when on. we're doing ministry. Yes. That's singing. Come on. That's teaching. Uh -huh. That's preaching. Yes. Hey, how do we prepare? We need to be listening and keen to what God is saying to us. Amen. You need to come up in there and yourself, honey. Yourself will get you in trouble. Sell this flesh. Yes. Ooh, hallelujah. So he took time <clears throat> to survey. He wanted to see exactly what needed to be done. All right. He finds the ruins just as the delegates have reported, just as those who reported to him, amen, the walls of Jerusalem are broken and their gates consumed with fire. They have been destroyed. In some of the places, such as the fountain gate and the king's pool, the rubble is so extensive that his mouth could not get through, meaning he couldn't even go through it with his animal. And we'll read on about that. Verse 16, it says, And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, Neither had I as yet told, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. So underneath that it says, why Nehemiah had why did Nehemiah not tell anyone? So Nehemiah had already seen that their enemies, Sambalat, 
whose name, like the devil, speaks of hatred. Tobiah, who represents religious people who don't want to accomplish too much. Uh-oh. And Gisham, whose name means hard rain and represents adversity, oppose this work. These individuals oppose the work that he was about to embark upon. So Nehemiah's silence protects the plans from sabotage. And I wrote that there is much power in silence. We got to sometimes learn to keep our mouth shut. Don't yeah. tell folk everything you're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, God has given any, each and every of us each and every one of us individual direction. Yes, we are a community. We are the body of Christ. And yes, we come together and work in a community. But for each and every one of us, he has a purpose and a plan for us. Yes, he does. And sometimes when you're sharing the purpose and the plan that he has for you, other believers, not even trying to be naysayers, won't understand that. Mm. Because why? The word wasn't for them. It was for who? You! So we gotta sometimes just just take a pause, be silent. Don't tell all your business. My mama used to tell us that as a little girl. Yeah, don't run your mouth all the time. Everybody ain't gonna be happy for you. That's it. Yeah, everybody not gonna encourage you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody not gonna get in that one mind of whatever it is that you destined to do. That they're not gonna be there with you. And it doesn't mean that they're against you, but it's just it it it's really it is it's wisdom. Yeah. Because God has given it to you to work. Amen. All right. So there is power in what? Silence. All right. Let us uh, discuss verse 17. Then said I to them, ye see the distress uh, that we are in. Uh, and this is the memory verse. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem. That we be no more a reproach. Think about this. This is the cupbearer. He been in the king's palace. I, I, I'm just trying to make it clear for you. He hasn't been in this ruin, but he's been in the king's palace. But he left that because of what his concern for his people, and came back to the ruin. And he's delivering this motivation, if you will, a, a, a part of them, saying, "Let us, yeah." I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to tell you that you need to do this and then go on back to the palace. But let us do this. Let us read underneath. Although he served the king, Nehemiah identifies with the pain of his people. Yeah. He includes himself saying, ye see the distress that we are what? In. Nehemiah reminds the people that they are being humiliated about the condition of their proud city. Yeah. Their enemies, their surrounding, uh, you know, uh, towns are humiliating them. Yeah, they know who they are. They know their God. Amen. And they're talking negative against them. You don't even have a wall to protect you. Your city lie in ruins. And we can liken that to if folk came to our church, the edifice, if you will, and it wasn't clean. Yeah, we got trash everywhere. Uh -huh. Yeah. Or it was something that we could not do. Like this week, uh, this week they fixed the steeple. Yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. Because we had what? Some, some, some issues with it. Right. Rain coming on the inside of the church. Right. You know? right. So our pastor had a burden to get it what? Fixed. Hallelujah. And the men got together. Amen. Yes, and we got it fixed. Amen. Because yeah. we didn't want to be ridiculed like our church is falling apart. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Come on.
and they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So Nehemiah, underneath that verse, and his contemporary Ezra speak of the good hand of the Lord upon them. You'll find that in Ezra 7, 9, also in chapter 8 and 18, and then Nehemiah 2 and 8. As a sign of his blessing, Nehemiah informs the leaders of Israel of the king's approval and support, morally and materially. Nehemiah never doubted that he was on a mission for God. God's hand was upon him, not only to reconstruct the wall, but also to establish the economic and social stability of the Jewish community. Amen. Light under the word. It's entitled We. In your books, it says, and I'm going to read, uh, starting at the wise leaders. I just want to touch on that. It says, wise leaders identify with the people and motivate them to work towards a solution. Amen. Leaders are not just giving taskings. A good leader is there working with you. Amen. A good leader knows your concerns. A good leader knows your struggles. Amen. But he's there or she's there with you to work through them. That's a good leader. Just as Nehemiah returned to lead his people, Christians can't live, can live in isolation because we are a community of believers. Spirit-led projects carried out under spiritual guidance succeed when measured by God's definition of success. Leadership is defined by the way we treat our followers. It is. We first, those that are in leadership position, were first followers. And I'm going to tell you right now, they don't stop being followers either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we've never, we, a leader has never arrived. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, our leader is uh, Pastor uh, Hughes. But we follow him as he what? Follows Christ. Yeah, and his leader is uh, for our jurisdiction is Bishop Mark Thomas. And for Bishop Mark Thomas, it is the prelate of the grand old church of God in Christ, Bishop Sheen. Yeah. So you're going to have someone that you're going to have to follow. Amen. I don't get it with these folk who be like, I want to be in business for myself. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. Well, honey, the tax man going to tell you what to do. Come on. I'm just being real with you. Yes. Your customers are going to tell you what to do. Yes. If you really want to have a successful business. Yeah. So you are never not going to be under authority. So why not? We're going to lean right here. Why not be under the authority of God? I'm going to just yeah. throw that in there. Yeah. yeah. And let him direct your path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So... Verse 19 and 20, amen. Uh, but when Sanballat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the servant, the, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn. Now, these three individuals were government officials from, ne from the nearby Samaria. They, they weren't even in the land with them. They were nearby, coming and, and causing hate and discontent. What is this that ye do? That's what they asked him. Will ye rebel against the king? So remember, Nehemiah had not told that he had the king's approval. You know, right then we would have been like, I got the king's approval. What you talking about? But he didn't do that. Amen. Because it was none of their business. Amen. 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Uh, therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Underneath that, those verses let us read. As the work commences, the news of the project reaches neighboring countries. That the Israelites are rebuilding the city attracts the attention of the Sarabite, the Hornite, Tobiah, and Gisham. Enemies. They were enemies of the children of Israel. You'll find that in verse 10. These scornful distractors laugh and deride them and mockingly ask what they are doing to suggest that Nehemiah's actions are sedious, sedious, which is rebellion of the king. In answer to this challenge of his authority, Nehemiah affirms the ultimate source of his power. He didn't even say I had approval from the king because he wasn't even distracted by their, by their uh, mocking or their ridicule because it had nothing to do with them. The hecklers have no right, this is what he says, to stop the work. Neither do they have any portion in Jerusalem. In other 
words, these enemies have no justification for interfering with the work. These men will not be remembered, nor will their story be passed down, because they are not the ones who have helped Israel regain its position. Nehemiah stood on the ultimate source. It was God. It had nothing to do with them. You know, sometimes we entertain folk who we don't even need to entertain when they come with negativity. Why are we entertaining an unbeliever about the things that are happening in God's church? It's none of their business. So sometimes if we would just be like, I know what God has told me, rebuke that spirit and not engage in it, we would be better off. Amen. All right. Let us, I want to just recap though about the wall. It's not in the lesson, but I want to make sure we understand that under Nehemiah's leadership, they rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. Mm -hmm. You'll find that in chapter 6. Verse 15, 52 days. And I got news for you, honey. They didn't have no crane. They didn't have no, you know, uh, automated uh, work. It was by hand and foot. Hand and foot. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. The wall was 4,018 meters. That's approximately 2.5 miles long. About 40 feet high. And about eight feet thick. Honey, they put in some work. Yes. And God was hand was what? Upon them, like Nehemiah said. Amen. So gleaning, I want to go back to that verse 20. Gleaning from verse 20. And I'm going to read it in the God's Word translation. This was a powerful statement by Nehemiah. Verse 20, it says, The God of heaven will give us success. I answered them. This is when they were coming with their negativity and their discord and trying to, you know, you know, discourage them. So he said, the God of heaven will give us success. I answered them. We, his servants, are going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild. Amen. You have no property or claim or historic right in Jerusalem. Look, I bro, we must learn to have confidence in our obedience to God's direction and not look for confidence in man's approval. Let me say it again. We must have, we must learn to have confidence in our obedience to God's direction and not look for confidence in man's approval. If they would have heard or even, you know, begin to, you know, marinate, if you will, off of Solomon and the others' negativity, they would have begun to doubt God's direction. You see what I'm saying? Obedience is what we need to do God's will. Amen. So we should not be looking for man's approval on what God has told us to do. Yes, we are supposed to follow peace with all men, but I got news for you. Everyone is not going to be for you when you start doing what God tells you to do. Amen. Yeah. So we can't be looking for men to approve us off of what God Almighty has said for us to do. We don't know we don't know what their, what their motive is. They may be confused. They may not understand what God has revealed to us about what we need to be doing. Or they could be naysayers, just like they were experiencing here. So we got to stand in God's obedience and not be looking for man's approval. Amen. All right. And we got to remember, God is the author and finisher of our faith. Yes, he is. He is the solid rock. Mm -hmm. He's the foundation of our hope. Amen. On which we stand. He is our source. That's Acts 17 and 28. Paul said, for in him we move and have our what? Being. Amen. So in God we have power to move any mountain. The mountain represents obstacles. Amen. And to accomplish any task. In him. In our obedience to who? Him. Amen. Students' responses. And then we're going to end with another point. In your book it says, under... Students will survey their lives. Amen. It says in today's lesson, we read that once Nehemiah safely arrived in Jerusalem, he inspected the city walls and conducted a survey of damages. If we are truly concerned about rebuilding parts of our lives, we need to prayerfully assess what will be required. Mm. This week, or from now on, amen, but this week it says, make this a target of your prayer. Be honest with yourself. Yes, sir. Ask God to show you exactly what steps need to be taken. Only when we change lazy or sinful habits can we be free to be what God wants us to be. Rebuilding the wall took work. Yeah, 
They had got complacent in their situation. And sometimes we want to, you know, switch that word and be like, I'm being content in all things. No. <laughs> no, ma'am. That's, that's an excuse. But I'm content. The Lord, Lord called me to be content in all things. And you, 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 you are around ruin. You know, you are around something that you could make a difference. You are around, you know, uh, just desolation in which you could change. So it's not content. It's lazy and sinful habits. Amen. Think about David. King David said, and I'm reading this in the God Words translation. Lord, it said, 23, examine me, oh God. This is what we got to do. And know my mind. My mind and heart in the Bible are the same thing. Because out of the issues of our what? Out of our heart, the issues of life flow. Amen. So look, examine me, oh God. Yeah. And know my mind. Test me. And know my thoughts. 24 picks it up and says, see whether I am on an evil path. Uh, then lead me on the everlasting path. And that's Psalm 139, 23 through 30, 24. We got to understand that we may be on a path and we may be thinking that we are pleasing God. But have we asked him to search us? Have we asked him to examine our heart? Examine my motives? Lord, make sure that everything I'm doing is pleasing to you. Yes, Lord. Uh, and if he tell you that's not pleasing, if he tell you take that off, put that away, don't you go back and pick it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're trying to see him. We're trying to be on that path of what? Righteousness. I don't understand some of us believers who have went back and picked up stuff that God has delivered you from. God is a redeemer. When he redeemed us, he redeemed us for one time only. His blood still work. He don't have to go back to the cross. Why are we going back picking up stuff that he has told us to put down? So we got to do this thing. Examine me. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Reveal God. My, my heart in you. Mm -hmm. We're cleaning from the lesson. They were building a, rebuilding a physical wall. But, Lord, we need to spiritually rebuild our heart in you so that you will be pleased. Yeah. And this is not for the sinner man. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. This is for us believers. Yeah. So we got to get that in our heart, that, Lord, look at me. He already know, but he want us to be honest with him. You know, what am I doing that is not pleasing? Yeah. And when you begin to pray that prayer, he will begin to refine you. Yeah. And he'll begin to restore you to where he needs you to be. It's higher heights in God. But we get complacent. I'm saying, that's it. What? <laughs> this is a walk. Yeah. Yeah. Sanctification is a process. Yes. So just to say I'm saved is not enough. Jesus. Hallelujah. We want to be risen. We want to be resurrected with him. Amen. We want a new body. So we're going to have to ask the Lord honestly to search us, examine us, and have motivation to change. Amen. As he sees fit. I thank God for today's lesson. There is a prayer that is in your book, amen, and we'll read it in our like manner. Again, I just want to say thank you to all uh, for your tremendous support last Sunday. Uh, the press says, you're the best leader, Father. Thank you for reminding us that you use anyone bold enough to speak and work on your behalf to make a difference in our world. We want to be used by you. Thank you for giving us eyes to see and favor to move forward. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.